electricity flows through our modern world, empowering us to do a million things that make life possible and a million others that make it worthwhile. It is the energy that has powered development across the world and today it is the vital force that is transforming India, a country of more than a billion aspirations into a global economic powerhouse. Over the last four decades, India has increased its installed electricity generation capacity 50-fold. This growth was possible only because of a host of high-performance public sector power companies operating in a challenging environment to generate and deliver the power that energizes this vast nation. Companies like National Thermal Power Corporation, NTPC, which contributes more than one-fourth of the country's total power generation. Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited, BHEL, which provides the engineering backbone for India's power development. National Hydroelectric Power Corporation, NHPC, a giant in the hydropower sector with successful projects all over the country. Power Grid, one of the largest transmission utilities in the world, transmitting nearly half of India's total power generation across the country. The Power Finance Corporation, providing the much-needed financial muscle to develop major power projects, and the Rural Electrification Corporation, bringing the power of change to India's most remote villages and hinterlands. In the 1990s, the growing needs of a rapidly expanding economy brought the average national energy shortfall to 9%, the peak demand shortfall to 14%. The response was liberalization, the dismantling of controls and the move towards an efficient, market-driven power sector. For the first time, power was opened up for Indian and international private sector participation in a big way, allowing even for 100% foreign equity. As the millennium drew to a close, the real work on the dynamics of power reform began. One of the path-breaking initiatives has been the Electricity Act of 2003, a piece of legislation that has been described by many as revolutionary. Replacing the single buyer model with an independently regulated, open access, free market, multi-buyer, multi-seller system. This has several implications. Generation companies are no longer dependent on power purchase by the state electricity boards. Private producers can sell directly to industrial buyers. Captive power generation is allowed. Open access to the transmission and distribution system for all generation companies and end users. The huge field of power generation has been entirely de-licensed with the exception only of hydro and nuclear power. Central and state level independent regulatory commissions with wide ranging powers are bringing discipline and answerability into the sector. You see the main job of the regulatory commission is to balance the interests of all stakeholders the distribution companies, the transmission companies, the generation companies, and the consumers. Now, we have a special duty to protect the interests of the consumers and bring in accountability and discipline, particularly in the distribution sector. The problem areas of distribution losses and revenue recovery shortfalls, in particular, are being transformed by the restructured accelerated power development and reforms program. One of the areas where the impact of the new power environment can be clearly seen is distribution privatization. 
an example is Delhi, where private distribution companies have transformed the infrastructure as well as the consumer interface. New equipment, a fully metered network and efficient, courteous employees backed by the latest in electronic data management and monitoring are changing the entire profile of operations. The public of Delhi were getting so restless, angry because, you know, the power cuts were eight hours long, ten hours long. And there were only two options. The option was to continue as usual, try and improve the old organization, which obviously was incapable of being uh, reorganized, or to give it into private hands. The most important learning from uh, this whole exercise and experience of seven years of uh, unbundling and privatization of power sector in Delhi is that if the process, if a transparent and correct process is uh, followed, then in the long run it's better for the electricity sector to be run by the private sector and very, which should be very well chosen based on a good competitive criteria. Uh, so that the efficiencies which they bring in can be passed on to the consumers in terms of better services, stabilized tariff and continuity of power supply. We uh, have uh, spent almost a billion dollars in upgrading the network of Delhi and this has been done across the entire gamut of uh, building grid stations, building receiving stations, substations. Uh, changing of cables, uh, switch gears, automating everything, building a world-class KEDA network. We built in a lot of automation into the system. So we have now the state-of-the-art information technology systems. So we have the full ERP, SAP system working across the company, across all the facets of the businesses. We have leapfrogged rather than go from uh, uh, improvement in stages, we jumped from uh, the, the really old ages into the world-class network. Uh, before the unbundling, the government was investing and contributing in this sector to the tune of around 400 million US dollars per annum. Uh, after unbundling, uh, so far the government has not contributed anything because the efficiencies which have been brought in by reduction in uh, aggregate technical and commercial losses has funded for the upgradation of the system and uh, for uh, purchase of power to be supplied to the consumers. So I think now we've reached a point where not only is Delhi surplus in power, uh, but it is also able to buy power at cheaper rates because there's trading now in power. The new climate can also be seen in the many private sector power generation projects that have taken off in recent years. Major players have eagerly embraced the new opportunities in power generation. Uh, there's a huge amount of capacity going to come from the private sector. In fact, in my opinion, from 12th plan onwards, the private sector would be adding more capacity than the public sector in this country. Now you see um, almost about 15 to 20 players, new players in the power sector coming in into development of power projects in the form of IPP. So it'll, be a, it'll make a significant difference for the power sector. There are many, many opportunities now available in India. And, 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 and I think uh, the pie is so large, you know, whatever number of players you bring in, the, the pie is so large that we don't need to worry. There's enough business for everybody. The complexity of, of creating power assets in India is, is becoming simpler thanks to a very strong regulatory framework that is being implemented as we speak on a day-to-day -day basis with very clear, transparent rules for all players. And I think this is the direction in which if India continues to move, it will attract greater and greater investment from firms like ours. Up to 10 plan, the, in the power sector, the investment from the private was not more than 10% or so. But today it is more than 60%. And we see a big change in investor attitudes towards India and its power sector in particular. A spate of recent IPOs of both public and private sector power companies have been major successes in the stock markets. At Power Finance Corporation, we came up with uh, its initial public offer in February 2007, 
which was well received by the market and it was oversubscribed by 77 times which is a record for any public sector company till date. The generators today can manage their power projects uh, very independently. They can access capital from uh, investors across the globe and because the projects have become viable as I said the realizations mechanism has become uh, very streamlined. You can enter into PPAs, you can have uh, CRC regulated arrangements where you are given a minimum return on equity and you can sign up for projects on that basis. You can have merchant power uh, arrangements to sell power and you are because of the deficit which is going to be continuing for quite some time to uh, going forward also, the profitability of these projects has become very very visible and that has impacted investors from across the globe. As the second wave of power reforms shows significant signs of success, several major new initiatives are underway. 14 ultra mega power projects of 4000 megawatt each have been announced that will go a long way towards bridging the energy gap. Special purpose vehicles or SPVs make these projects truly hassle free for investors. Experience of private sector has been normally the development period is longer than the actual construction period. It was taking very long time to develop a project. The, the concept of ultra mega power project is that the government of India would do the development of the project. It brings to a particular shape, then hands it over to the private sector. Therefore, it's cutting short the significant amount of development period on this. It creates a shell company, it takes most of the clearances, it, it, it does significant amount of land acquisition process on this and then invites a bidding for this project. So a significant amount of three or four year period of work has already been done by government of India. And even thereafter, government of India would handhold you whenever there are problems in implementation of Ultramaga. I think this concept wise, the, this is one of the best concepts which we have introduced in this country in the power sector. Each power project consists of 4,000 megawatt, about $4 billion. Other opportunities include coal-based plants at pitheads or coastal locations, natural gas or CNG-based power plants at load centers, hydro power projects to generate 150,000 megawatts, the renovation and modernization of existing thermal and hydropower plants, and transmission network ventures for an additional 60,000 circuit kilometer by 2012. Private sector participation with 100% foreign equity is permitted in all these opportunities. The total value of these projects is about 150 billion US dollars over a five year horizon. One of the largest infrastructure investment opportunities in the world. That is to say nothing of the opportunities for executing projects globally, an area where Indian experience and expertise can have great value. Uh, having operated, developed and operated gas-based plants and even coal-based plants now, and even hydro-based plants, and even uh, some of the biomass-based plants, and operating some of the windmill assets. So this is a wide portfolio which we have been exposed to over the last uh, literally say 10 years. So this gives a lot of confidence in handling uh, uh, sector uh, in any part of the world. The new policies and projects also stand to benefit rural India in a big way. With the Electricity Act authorizing de-licensed, standalone rural power generation and distribution by village councils, NGOs and other local organizations, rural India is being empowered to achieve self-sufficiency in meeting its power needs. The Rural Electrification Program catalyzes this process by setting targets, providing incentives and facilitating activities. Nuclear energy is hardly a new area for India, but it is an area that is poised for major growth. With new agreements signed with United States, France and Kazakhstan and new framework for agreements with Canada and the United Kingdom being evolved, this sector should play a larger role in India's power profile in the coming years. Well, we're very excited that the United States and India could reach a historic agreement on civil nuclear power. And American nuclear companies are anxious to participate with their Indian counterparts in the expansion of India's nuclear power sector.
rounding off the picture of the new power in India is the all-important issue of energy conservation, alternate and renewable energy sources in an era when emission controls and climate change issues have become important. India has a strong wind energy program. In addition to you know, looking at more coal-based and gas-based uh, generation, we are already one of the leading investors in the wind sector with about 450 megawatts of uh, uh, wind projects uh, at different stages of implementation slash operation. Suzlong, an Indian company with a global presence, is one of the top ranking companies in wind energy across the world. The country has also launched the national solar mission for harnessing solar energy with an addition of 20,000 megawatt of solar power by 2022. major part of Aston Fields portfolio is solar PV and this and we are now embarking on building some of the first uh, solar pro PV projects in the country under the national solar mission and the state programs of Gujarat and Rajasthan. I, I believe that Aston Field will have a portfolio of over 100 megawatts within the next 24 months on photovoltaic which will make us one of the largest solar IPPs in the world. Uh, and I think that's the kind of opportunity India offers right now for renewables. The best part of solar is that solar can be deployed in marginal lands, it can be deployed in uh, desert land, arid climates, and also we have millions and millions of rooftops available in the country where it can be easily set up. And therefore, instead of uh, having a one power station centralized somewhere, we can have uh, practically every house acting as a powerhouse. Moser Bear, another Indian company, is a significant global player in solar photovoltaics with state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities. This is to say nothing of the successes in areas like biomass, biofuels, as well as micro projects. Alternative energy in India is set to go mainstream. Besides developing renewable alternatives for power generation, India is investing substantially in campaigns to raise awareness. As the message of energy conservation goes out to millions of Indians through these high-profile campaigns, consumer behavior is beginning to change. Even for the upwardly mobile urban middle class, appliances rated for power efficiency are now the norm. Supplementing all this is the development of infrastructure for coal washeries, with clean coal now becoming a mandatory requirement for all producers. This environmental friendly measure to reduce fly ash emissions and utilization of fly ash is also going to be an important emerging investment opportunity. As we move towards the future, we are also looking at power transaction services that maximize market efficiency. India is one of the international pioneers to have made power a tradable commodity with its own dedicated power exchange adjusting prices hourly through competitive bidding in the open market. The energy exchange is a marketplace, a competitive marketplace for buying and selling electricity like any other commodity. In India, the power exchanges are for physical delivery basis. So one can buy and sell power even as low as 1 megawatt, even for one hour, any time of the day. The market linkages are being matched by physical links in the actual infrastructure. Today, power in India can move freely to where it is needed, when it is needed. By developing a synchronous unified national grid, India is building a unique flexibility 
to link suppliers to consumers across the entire length and breadth of the country. Like the pursuit of alternative energy sources, this has important implications for energy security. Energy security for India is really about seeing the bigger picture of power. With electricity demand expected to double in the near future, the need is to develop a holistic vision of energy. A vision that maximizes energy security while addressing climate change issues by integrating India's diverse energy options. India is unique in the geographical diversity of its resources. A diverse and abundant resource base empowering development beyond our imagination. Assured, sustainable and powerful development that will transform the lives of all people and create a global benchmark. As India moves rapidly to its rightful position of being a global economic power in Asia, the power sector is charged up with an energy quite unlike anything in its creditable but checkered past. The new economy has matured from its tentative start into a confident reality. And in this vibrant market-driven economy, the transformation of the power sector is really a transformation of the entire country, an empowerment unlike anything ever seen before.